Doug asked me to introduce the uh, final speaker of the afternoon, Bill Williamson. And, uh, <laughs> uh, my first encounter with Bill would have been back in, I don't know when exactly, but it was a long time ago. He was a patroller at Alpine, although he started his career at Sugar Bowl. But Sugar Bowl was sort of the, uh, the farm team for the Alpine Meadows Ski Patrol, in which he, he graduated to and became one of their starting pitchers. And uh, so Bill was on an exchange with Alta and uh, Alta being next door to Snowbird, he, you know, they would, he'd come down to Snowbird. And he showed up and he really looked a lot like Greg Allman. <laughs> and uh, really long blonde hair, full beard, and really nothing like the grooming standards that we had at Snowbird. <laughs> and so Bill's out on the tram dock with the Alta Ski Patrol coat on, and the mountain manager who was didn't quite get the long hair or beard thing. And when he would get mad, his veins would start to like pump out on his forehead. <laughs> and so Bill's here, and I'm over here, and Hoopy's here, standing at the office door, and I see him like clenching like the Hulk does, the steel bars and leaving his fingerprints, and the <laughs> veins are starting to pop off because there's Dwayne Allman look-alike wearing an Alpha Ski Patrol jacket that's come through the side door and is waiting to get on the tram in front of the 120 respectable dues-paying skiers that are about to get on. And I managed to run out there and intercede and say, oh no, this is Bill Williamson. He's a, he's a famous ski patroller from Alpine Meadows and he's doing an exchange with Alpha. Um, after Bill's stint in Alpine Meadows, which was very colorful and long-lasting and memorable, he became the ski patrol director at Stevens Pass. I don't know how many of you know much about Stevens Pass, but it's some kind, somewhat of a redneck place. If you know Marty Schmoker or Mike Sanford, those guys are, you know, they kind of qualify as rednecks. And so when Bill shows up there and he's giving his talk to the ski patrol, uh, which I guess there had been some like issues with uh, the relationship between management and the ski patrol director and the staff. And, Bill got everybody in the room and said, well, uh, you know, I understand that my predecessor was, uh, you know, kind of a by the rules guy and was really involved in law enforcement and like guns and, uh, you know, kind of just kind of a different guy. And I just want you to know that my background is that I've been a doobie, uh, a roadie for the Doobie Brothers for the past 10 years. <laughs> so Bill has moved on from there to many other places. He's been in a lot of snow climates. He's been dealing with snow and avalanches for a long time. He's been kind enough to let me kind of pretend to be a snow guy up at Schweitzer Mountain a little bit, which is really good for me. And so Bill's gonna tell some stories. So listen up close. <laughs> There's some exaggerating there too, right? <laughs> I didn't work for the Doobie Brothers for 10 years. A uh, couple, maybe a couple. So when I uh, was invited here, which I, I have to tell you, I want to thank Doug and actually uh, Scotty as well for my invitation. I mean, I <coughs> feel pretty honored to be amongst this group of people, that, these speakers that are up here and uh, really flattered. I mean, I'm pretty young to be with these guys. I mean, I've only been doing this for 40 years. And, and so I was, I was sort of flattered. And I started thinking about what I should talk about. And... Uh, how I wouldn't have as cool of stories as someone like Liam. So I, I thought, well, first, I don't want to talk about myself, and secondly, I definitely don't want to sit up here and tell old war stories. <clears throat> and the last thing I would ever want to do is sit up here and read something to you. And I figured that's the way you guys would feel. Well, that's too bad, because that's exactly what I'm going to do, is talk about myself <laughs> and, and read a couple of war stories. i got two stories I wanted to read to you. They're sort of intertwined, so we'll... Um, We'll start with that. Thirty-three years ago yesterday, March 31st, my life and many others' lives changed forever. Homo rocks, a slide path of approximately 800 vertical feet that had been shot with artillery that morning, pulled out about five feet deep on the interface of the Nultfries spring pack in the new snow. 
took the entire slope's worth of new snow and came across the base area of Alpine Meadows, destroying the building that covered the bull wheel for the main summit lift. It also threw snow across the deck of the main lodge and through its doors, while adjacent paths off the buttress and the pond slopes covered large portions of the parking lot. It was nine years earlier that I left Hawaii for the mainland. I had lived there throughout my teens, and with the exception of when I was attending college in Southern Cal, I spent most of my life on the beaches of the North Shore of Oahu. When I arrived in California, my cousin took me skiing a couple times in the following fall. After not being able to take some courses at the local school, I started, decided to learn how to ski and get a job at a ski area. At Alpine Meadows, the Summit Lift Building also was the locker room and the offices for several departments, including ski school, lift operations, and ski patrol. The air blast and snow, along with 200 plus year old trees, totally demolished the building. There were seven employees in it when the slide hit, including my boss, mountain manager, Bernie Kingery. There were other employees around the area, but the majority of them, mostly patrollers, had gone out to do control on the Alpine access road. There were also non-employees in the parking lots. When it was all said and done, 11 people were involved with the slide, three of whom were thrown from the summit terminal building and were either totally or partially buried, but were quickly recovered and with little or no injuries, leaving eight unaccounted for. My first job at the ski area was in a hotel as a porter. I quickly moved to the maintenance department where I got a cooler job driving snow cat. After a few weeks, I got a roommate who was a ski patroller. He changed my life forever, inspiring me with his love for skiing and love for patrolling. On the 31st, I was on top of the mountain when the slide occurred. I'd been there from early on during the storm for about two and a half days. We were there, as was done for most large storms, to get out and do control, control work so the patrol could, uh, so the snowcats could access the top of the mountain and we could make sure that the lift could run clear. Shortly after the slide occurred, we received a bunch of frantic calls from the base area. Then all communication through phone shut down. When we finally put together what may have happened, I had a concern that several patrollers were in the building when it occurred and thought they might be victims too. These were not only co-workers, but also best friends and mentors. Fortunately, the majority of the patrollers were on the road when it occurred. We contacted them to return and they started the search process. This is, the, this is looking at the deck on the main lodge through the summit building and this is the parking lot when we started removing snow uh, <coughs> later on. I've always thought I've been lucky and I certainly was in my early days working at ski areas. Lucky with the people I met, lucky with some of the decisions I made and definitely lucky with the outcome of the decisions. Lucky with the jobs I took and lucky with the teachers I had. My roommate Doug turned into a good friend, a good teacher, and then a good mentor. Another teacher turned mentor, Norm, who was with Monty at Squaw in the original Avalanche, Avalanche Hunter days, lived down the road, Donner Pass Road, and was a great sounding board for many years in all aspects of avalanche work. After a couple years of learning how to ski and a couple years patrolling at a smaller area at Sugar Bowl, I got a job at Alpine Meadows on patrol, home of the most recorded avalanches annually in the U.S. back then. There I met Tom, another friend, teacher, turned mentor. I was very lucky to meet Doug Richmond, Norm Wilson, and Tom Kimbrough. <coughs> Rescue crews left late that night because of exhaustion and building avalanche hazard. The next morning, ironically, Bluebird, I walked out to the end of the point and it appeared that every slide path that could have that could be seen had slid, and the debris across the base area was huge. The large avalanche rescue cache that was stored in the summit bottom terminal building was strewn across the entire base area, along with walls, lockers, clothes, and anything else that might be in an office or locker room. 
Fortunately, we had an additional 100 probes stored at the top of the lift, and by mid-morning, a helicopter showed up. We loaded the probes and flew down and joined the rescue efforts. Three bodies had already been found in the parking lot, including little girl and her father. Another victim, Jake, a friend and trail crew member, was found not too far from his snowmobile, and we started digging through the building looking for other victims. By the end of the day, we found two more bodies, one in the doorway of the lift ops office and the other under one of the <coughs> large walls. This told us that at least one, it turned out to be two, had been blown out the windows by the air blast before the walls were knocked over. My first year's patrolling, I tried to be a sponge, learning what I could from my mentors, from senior patrollers experiences, from classes and books, lots of books. Learning from my experiences. My first full year of patrolling, my partner Jim and I were caught in four slides. Can you say rookie mistakes? Most memorable was both of us standing in a bomb hole. The shot goes off 100 feet away, and we're both going down on a two and a half foot hard slab. I grab Jim's collar and start hiking up the slab. We fall off as we go over the top of the staunch hole. Lots of hairy times back then, like with most inexperienced AVI workers. I was lucky that there weren't any fatal mistakes that I made or my comrades made, but that changed. I don't have a creepier memory in my life than the one on April 1st in 82 when I was alone in the first aid room that was attached to the main lodge. No power, no lights and the snow had avalanched into the doors. I was arranging the frozen bodies that were stored in there, making room for a couple more. Shortly after that, we left the rescue site and efforts due to building hazard from the storm that had settled back in. We wouldn't be able to return for a couple days, and in the meantime, we bombed the shit out of the place. When we did return, it was five days after the slide and we were still missing two people, a lift operator named Anna Conrad and our mountain manager, Bernie. Between winters at Sugar Bowl and Alpine, I spent the summer in New Zealand, working at a place called Porter Heights, filling me with lots of experiences and again introduced me to several great people. I actually met La Chapelle there for the first time when I was one of about 20 people who attended the first New Zealand National Avalanche Workshop. It was weird that over the next 10 years that many of the people I met there would be affected catastrophically by avalanche incidents. There was me in 82 with the 82 slide, my roommate Tom Snyder down in Queenstown who would be killed while leading a control route in Highland Bowl in 84. Josh Lang, a fellow, patro a fellow patroller down there, was involved in a slide <coughs> in Canada while, gu while guiding for CMH in 91. She survived, but nine of her guests didn't. Then there was Dave McNulty, who ran our small patrol at Porters, also passed in 87 in an avalanche while holly in New Zealand. My days of not seeing people pay the ultimate price for not making the right decisions were way behind me. At Alpine, when we returned to the site, I think it was on Sunday, it was with <coughs> body recovery in mind. Most of us had a attended Jake's, the trail crew member's funeral the service the day before. And the, pro the process of rescue was unlike anything we had ever trained for. The basic probe line method was problematic and dogs, one of whom had been buried in the building for the first day and night, had problems because of all the, great, uh, because of all the debris. We would probe, then a snow cat would come in, then we'd use chainsaws to cut the walls up into manageable pieces then we would probe again. It took hours. It seemed like it took much longer. I'm not sure if it was Lanny or Bernard who saw it first, but under a pile of lockers and snow, they saw a hand move. It was Anna, and she had lived five days eating snow. As we extricated her and got her into the helicopter, all 100 plus rescuers stopped, and when it got airborne, they let out a great cheer a true miracle during what had been five tormenting days. I remember Kimbrough yelling, now let's find Bernie. And we did. It took a couple more hours, 
and he was in really bad shape. He was in a tree well, and it had flown between 75 to 100 feet, and it was obvious that he had struck it at a very high rate, but the search was over. We became pretty gun-shy at Alpine after spring of 82. We used more explosives, performed rescue practices frequently, and had an incredible camaraderie amongst the patrollers. For me, I was trying to learn as much as possible, attending classes, ISSWs, and local workshops. Litigation continued on for years over the slide dividing the nation's avalanche experts. I got to meet some very knowledgeable people during that time. Chris Stetham, I spent some time with Liam, Lots of time with, with Norm Wilson, and most notably, Andre Rowe from Switzerland, who probably won the jury over and probably was a key reason that we prevailed in litigation. This is an experience that I remember back on frequently and a defining moment in decisions I would make for the rest of my career. I left Alpine 13 years later to work as a patrol director in Washington that's where I sold out to big time management, became an ops director, and that's what I continue to do today. This is Bernie Kingry, the uh, mountain manager there. So I put together a few questions, some thoughts. I mean, it's, I don't expect everybody here to answer them or anything, but uh, you know, what could have been done differently? Someone asked me the other day, did you guys have the place on lockdown or anything? But we actually felt that we were proactive in doing this. We had done control not that long before, and uh, so I don't know. I mean, lots of, you could come up with lots of things here. What can you learn from that type of an experience? Well, you can learn that you can always expect the unexpected. It's, you're never going to get it under control here. And how do you prepare, prepare for the unfathomable? I think you, you go through all your training and train on as much things as you can think of. When something that you can't think of happens, you're going to be a little more prepared for it. And uh, I hope I am from those, in, those experiences. How do we prevail through the litigation? You know, I would tell you at the time, and still Alpine has a uh, if, uh, state of the art or um, industry standard program in place. And I'd say at that time they had a real high one. And that made it easy because of the uh, documentation and all that that we did well. And again, Andre Roque showing up and being like Maurice Chevalier sort of won the uh, jury over. It was pretty cool. And how does something like this affect your staff? Well, I would tell you that uh, myself and, and my friend Larry, we probably went one direction trying to learn more because of this and, uh, and get on top of it so we have a better understanding of what had happened. And I would tell you that there were other people there that I worked with uh, that probably suffered some post-traumatic stress syndrome and uh, sort of got out of the business and didn't want to be involved anymore. So it, it changes people a lot. You know, I put together this little list of life lessons and after hearing the five previous people here, I don't think there's gonna be anything here that you guys haven't heard, but I have sort of near the top of my list, you want to be lucky. And uh, as everybody has said, <clears throat> You know, you definitely want to try and learn from your mistakes. If you don't do that, you're going to fail again. So, you know, making mistakes is going to happen, but if you don't learn from them, it's shame on you. You want to avoid being hubris. And I mean, it's pretty easy when you're a cool young buck mm -hmm. ski patroller to be out there telling people what's going on, but humble is good. Be professional. You know, you want to keep your head in the game. You want to know what's going on all the time out there. You want to be a good listener and definitely respect experience. You want to pick good mentors. I was very fortunate in that. And then you want to be a good team member. You don't need to necessarily be the leader, but you need to be a good member. And did I, you want to have fun. I think most people do that that uh, work in this industry. And I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, but you want to be lucky. Yeah, that's kind of key, so I would work on that if you guys haven't yet. The other thing we were asked to do is what you would go back in time and, and uh, tell a young yourself. So I put together my top ten things to tell young Bill. And uh, 
you should take lots of photos because someday someone might ask you to do a presentation <laughs> about the last 40 years. <laughs> There's a local hero right there with you. Okay, don't waste a bunch of time trying to figure out what you're gonna do when you grow up because you don't. You know, science-wise, I would probably tell myself to be more aware of those surface hoar layers pay a little more attention to those sweet spots for spatial variability, and then I'd show him how to, the shovel compression test so he could really rule people over back then. If you want to have fun, take advantage of the loose rules everywhere because it's not going to be like that much for <laughs> <laughs> Number five, you want to appreciate each day. Number six, I was told by a guy, Roger McCarthy, that you might need to move. You might need to move to move, which unfortunately, as you can see from this, I couldn't keep a job and I, those are all the places I work. <laughs> you know, if you get into a management position, you're hiring people, remember the number one quality for a good winter employee is that they have a good summer job. <laughs> During the tough times, keep your cool, try and keep a sense of humor. Appreciate the wealth of good friends good mentors, hold them in highest regard and respect. And then number 10, what I'm gonna tell myself, make sure you make this guy your best buddy. <laughs> <laughs> that was it for me. I don't know if you guys have any questions. suggesting there were some things that were done wrong. I guess I'm just watching you, looking at your pictures and wondering, what was the, what was the feeling amongst the crew uh, in the days, months, years after that event? Amongst yourselves, I mean, did you, how was, how was that, what was the attitude? Well, I think, I think for the most part, we did feel like there was more that we could have done to have prevented it. I don't think any of us thought at the time that we were, we were failing at, at what we were doing or not <coughs> putting enough thought in it. But we obviously, we went out shortly after that and built huge 40-foot walls to protect buildings, protect part of the base area. We recognized that these small, this is only 800 vertical feet. I mean, Andre Roche was there, he told me that they might not even look at that ever, and the Alps sometimes is a major path, and that, uh, you know, this is nothing. And we were going, yeah, but uh, obviously it was. But uh, I think we, we tried to just be a little more defensive against those types of things, be proactive and, and diligent. I think uh, our forecasters were on a higher level after that. They just, they, they took everything a little more seriously. And, uh, Try to do a better job. No. You're right, though. There were some. I think being a plaintiff's expert is probably one of the easiest jobs in the world. I mean, it's really easy to look backwards and say, "Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that?" And when it's coming from people like Ed LaChapelle and our mayors, and that it's it has a lot of strength and it makes you doubt yourself because here's a guy that you're thinking is the best avalanche guy in the world, maybe and he's just uh, sort of hammering on your program. But like I said, it's so easy to, to use hindsight to be right. So. Well, when was uh, Alpine, uh, when did Alpine open? What year? I think it was 63. 63. And? I think it was, well, it was right after the Olympics. Yeah. Now, did my at water have anything to do with the layout of Alpine. I'm not, not that I'm aware of. I, I don't think so. We, um, <coughs> no, not that I'm aware of. I, 
I'm, I'm not saying he did it definitely, but I know that they did a lot of experimenting over there. They used some early on avalanches there. We, um, so. I would just point out that uh, uh, I'm not taking any sides here, but the plaintiffs, I think, were able to point out that there was some historical evidence of avalanches overrunning the uh, lower left and the control room. But then I would like to also point out that in 1963, the state of the art for avalanche dynamics in this country on a scale of one to 10 was a Navy one. <laughs> we knew nothing nor did we need to know anything about avalanche dynamics, which includes how far an avalanche path may run. Okay. And speaking to exactly that point this year, Nevada has one of the longest runout ratios I talked about earlier, of any mountain range that that figure's been done. But we didn't, we didn't know that in 82, but Beers developed that much later than that. You wouldn't have known this. was know where this alpha angle concept came from, which was in the late 80s, maybe? Well, yeah, Bomi, Bomi did that earlier. But uh, it, it was the 80s development where it really started to be part of the culture. And you, it, it came from the NGI, the Norwegian Geophysical Institute. Is that the name? Geotechnical Institute. Yeah, the yeah. Geotechnical Institute. And uh, correct me here, do you want to explain that? I'm done. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> By all means. Uh, well, in Norway, they have uh, some big avalanche paths, long, long running avalanche paths, a lot of vertical over what we would say a thousand feet or they would say 350 meters or so, and uh, a completely flat valley floor. And these uh, valley meadows were started to be farmed several hundred years ago. And so the farmer would build his, his cow shed here. Well, it would get wiped out, so he'd move it back here. It would get wiped out, so he would move it far enough away so it never got hit. And so they had hundreds of years, or a couple hundred years of, of data. And that's how I heard they came up with the album. <laughs> And uh, it, it's great because uh, any of us can take a little uh, chronometer to go out there. I, I use it all the time in the courses. What's the angle of, of this, alpha angle of this pass? Are we okay standing here? Then you have to come out uh, with some data on how far avalanches run in different snow climates and so forth. So I, I just throw that out. It's, and they run farther in the Sierra Nevadas than they do. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I'll the lowest ones uh, that Mears measured anyway. He had some uh, some in the low teens, or maybe even like 12 degrees or something. Yeah. In, uh, in the Sierras. Cascades. Why is it? Snow climate. Heavier snow. I, 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 that's, I, why I, he, that's why you. That's why we do it. Yeah, different patterns. We were just talking up here, a question that we meant to ask you when you were up there, Dave, was um, like whether design avalanches, you know, you always hear about design avalanches being dry, but some of the biggest runouts that some of us have seen, at least in this neighborhood, have been wet. wet Long runs. running avalanches? Yeah. But you hear mirrors, you know, he's talked about most of the stuff, most of the maximum runouts being dry, and I assume this one was dry, kind of the rocks. Yeah. I don't know what your experience has been in the last year. If most of your biggest ones, the, the design avalanches run into the end of the past, this dry. one dry usually? Yeah. They, they run a lot. 
Do you know what the off angle was? From the I don't. The I don't. What? The vertical fall of that avalanche is at, as I recall, was 700 feet. Yeah, 800, yeah. I mean, right in between 700 and 800, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you.